I want to speak this morning about how to live a victorious life. How many people want to live a victorious Christian life? And uh, I, I believe that it is very, very important. Uh, to live in victory, we humans have to understand a lot of things. And I want to lift this book up this morning, not because of what David said, but this is our manual, amen? This is your owner's manual. Now, like most of us, and I believe that most of us are like the rest of us, when we go to uh, IKEA and we buy one of those boxes of goodies and we open it up, we always try to put it together without looking at the manual, <laughs> without looking at the instructions. And usually when you're finished, you find that you've got a few parts left over. And then you go to the manual and you find out, <laughs> what did I do wrong here? But this book, I believe, is our manual. It's something that we can live with. Everything you need to know on how, on the how-tos are written in this book. Do you believe that? Written in this manual. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that it's got to be spiritually discerned. It's not a book that you read with the natural mind. It's got to be spiritually discerned. It says here, 1 Corinthians 2.14, it says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Bible speaks about a man in, called Zechariah, and he was one of the top prophets of the day. And God came and started to speak to him. And he, said, he started off in Zechariah and he said, I want you to know I am very, very angry with your fathers because they've gone astray, they've gone away. They've drifted away and they've got their own thing now. And here is this prophet, a, a, a great man of God, and a, but he spoke to this man and he started to reveal things to him. It's a good thing to read Zechariah. It's a good thing to see as the Spirit of God starts to speak to this man. But one of the things that he said to him in Zechariah 4, 6, he said, It is not by might and it is not by power, but it's by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And I think that we humans, now the church, God's people, if we just continue to think with our natural mind and try to work everything out and try to do everything that sounds right and seems right, we'll fail. See, the Bible is written not in a natural way. It's a spiritual book. And there's a lot of things in the Scriptures that seem strange. And even in the Old Testament, when the enemy came, uh, and it was strange because there were many times when the enemy came, he came with a flurry, with a mass thing, with mass destruction on his mind, that he wanted just to wipe out the people of God. And as they came many times, God warned the people. He spoke to them and he did supernatural things. We know there that there's one story there where, where uh, Jehoshaphat and the armies that came against him and there was hopelessness, there was no way out in the natural. And what we've got to understand is that if you just try to work out the situations or problems that are in your life naturally, you'll fail. Oh, yes, you might do a few things there, but ultimately I'm talking about living victoriously. Is understanding the, the language of the Bible. Understand that it's a spiritual book and that God does things by His Spirit that will blow the natural mind. With Jehoshaphat, the armies were there and they were coming against them. And, and, but the Spirit of God says, started to speak to Jehoshaphat started to speak to the people that were there. Oh, you people, listen to what I've got to say. And he went on 
and told the story. And it says there that Jehoshaphat and his people, they began to worship and they began to praise God. And they started to go out. And as they went out and as they got to the battle line, I would imagine that they found that supernaturally God had got involved with the enemy and caused them to stir against each other. And they began to destroy each other until there was not one left. You see, there is some stories there that says the battle's not yours, it's mine. I can do more than you could ever imagine or think. You find there that there was a young man by the name of Peter. And there was trouble in the camp and people were being killed. And now they put Peter in jail. They just killed and stoned one of the great men of God and seemed to help the people seem to think that was a great thing. And so now they go out and they arrest Peter. They throw him into jail. Just so happened that it was a time where they couldn't do it and they had to wait a few days. And so Peter's in jail and he's asleep. But the Bible says that an angel walked into the room. See, if we, if we only think natural, we'll get natural results. But if we can start to change the way we think and do things a little bit differently and, and start to draw on and believe for the mighty power of God to manifest himself in your situation and in your circumstance, Perhaps we might get a spiritual result. And as, as Peter was there, it says the angel walked in and says, and they give him a bit of a kick and says, Arise, Peter. But the thing that blew me away a little bit was when he stood up, the chains that bound him fell off. See that song that Greg sings there, And I will rise. And I will rise above the shame and of the fear and the guilt and everything like that. See, they're the sort of things that hold us down. They're the things that push us down. But when we begin to rise and when we begin to stand and when we begin to understand who we really are and what God's really done for us and what God wants to do for us, then as you begin to stand, as you begin to stand, the chains will begin to fall from our lives. The things that hold us bound, the, the, whatever it might be. I would imagine that there's many, many things that we can talk about here. It's not by mind, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit. And so there's a spirit thing that's going on. See, the Holy Spirit is not some mystical thing. Unfortunately, there's demonic Unfortunately, there's witchcraft. Unfortunately, there's so many different things in, in society today. There's so many different orders that are not God, that have a form of God, that try to pretend they're God, that try to act like God, do things that God does. It's the occult. There is a demonic realm. We live in a spirit world. Whereas spirits activated and motivated and walk around and do things and deceive. But you see, the Holy Spirit is not some mystical thing. When you start talking about the Spirit, people start to get jumpy. Start to think you're going off your brain. You see, we need to keep our spirit man strong. It's very, very important. In Joshua, very interesting uh, scriptures here. Because I want to say this, the Word of God says, <laughs> friend, we will never stop. Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. Very interesting scriptures here. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of, of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, and everybody say, arise. You see, if we don't arise, nothing changes. If we don't start to stand up, nothing changes. And we find again, Joshua would have been in a situation 
where his master or his, or his hero or whatever you want to call him is dead. One that he thought so much about and worked so hard and got involved with is dead. And so God comes on the scene and starts to speak to him. Arise and go over. This Jordan, you see, the Jordan was like a hindrance. The Jordan was something that separated where they were and where God wanted them to go. Every one of us has got a Jordan. Every one of us has got something we've got to cross. Every one of us has got a promise that God has for us. But there's usually a Jordan. There's usually a hindrance. There's usually something that can separate us. We've got to arise. We've got to start walking towards it. We've got to start pushing through. Go over this Jordan, you and this people, to the land which I am given to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. It goes on in verse 5, it says, No man shall be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which my servant commanded you. And do not turn from it from the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate. You shall meditate. You shall meditate in it day and night. And you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage, and be not afraid nor dismayed? For the Lord your God is with you. Wherever you go, wherever you go, meditate. We know that Jesus came to fulfill the law. We know that God broke that thing. He smashed that thing. I do not live under law now. I live under the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that I can do whatever I like. The law that God wants upon my life now is even greater than the Old Testament law. It says, don't, it says don't commit adultery there, but it says now don't look upon a woman with lust. God fulfilled the law, but the promise that he made and the, and the fundamental truth that's in this is just as real today as it ever was. We must observe, but we've got to meditate. Meditate. And this is the thing that when we come to meditation, and I said before, there's so many different things now that, that go into all this stuff. We see people standing like this doing yoga. We see people doing all... Oh, man, I didn't know I could do that. Dear Jesus, how was that? Didn't think I could get it up that far. <laughs> but you see, there's all these things that are substitutes that are not the real thing. So now when, when it comes to the things of God and you start speaking about some of this stuff, that I'm going to start speaking about shortly, we start to say, oh man, this is, this, this is going wonky. You thought the communion was wonky, it's going to get wonky. <laughs> but it's real, it's truth. We've got to understand that we've got to meditate and, 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 and dream and think and do things. I believe that, that God's Word tells us who we are in Christ and what we can overcome in Jesus Christ. We're singing songs there about overcoming the world, overcoming, triumphing, being victorious, ruling and reigning with Jesus. In Christ Jesus, our spirit or our inner man knows what the spirit can do with me. The spirit, my inner man, knows what God can do and, he, and when he comes and, and starts to speak to me and starts to share things that he wants to do, 
Unfortunately, it's got to go through my natural mind as well. And the war rages between my natural mind and my spirit man. And if we don't, if we don't understand some things, we will fall foul to our natural man and our natural man will conquer us. Your spirit and man knows what he can do through Christ. What stops us receiving from God? Our feelings. Anybody here got feelings? Come on. Feelings, our feelings. We feel unworthy. Our emotions say, I don't deserve forgiveness. What I've got to do and what I've got to understand is if God's Word, if God's Word says something, it's mine. If God says that I can be healed, that means I can be healed. As a matter of fact, it says I am healed. If God's Word says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, God's Word is truth. So what stops the church that is most supposed to be the most powerful force on earth, why is it playing second fiddle to a defeated enemy? Why does it allow the enemy to triumph over us? You see, it's more than just reading the Bible. It's more than just singing a song. We've got to allow our feelings. You see, if your feelings get around you, it'll take you into depression. It'll take you into negativity. Say before I was saved, I murdered someone. I didn't, by the way. Now I'm saved, how do I deal with the guilt? How do I deal with the shame? How do I deal with the pain? You've got to rise up. You've got to rise above it. I'm glad you sang that song this morning, Greg. We've got to rise above it. We've got to push through. We've got to, we, we can't allow the enemy to do something like that to us. So if my feelings can bring me into depression, if the enemy is allowing, if he's allowed there to do it, and you see, with our feelings, we've all, we've all, caught, we've all done it, amen? We've all allowed our feelings to, to control us and take us into that, that negative state. Well, I believe feelings are very, very important. And so what I'm saying for you today is that you meditate on the love of God. If you don't feel love or whatever, if you don't know, but you meditate on it. You see, you've got to meditate on it until you feel the love of God. I've never felt the love. Somebody might say, I've never felt this. No, you've got to meditate on it until you literally feel the love of God. See, you, 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 you hear people who say, you know, I went into my prayer room. I went in here. I went there. I was driving the car the other day. And while I was driving the car, and I don't recommend this. It's not a good practice, really. But you start to meditate on the love of God. Or you start to meditate on some promise of God. And you start, and all of a sudden, that thing now, all of a sudden, it becomes yours. You feel that thing. You feel that thing. You see, Paul was in a meeting. And he was preaching. And there was a man there that was crippled from birth, sitting in the, in the congregation. And while he was listening to the message, sometimes in a message, you might get one line of a message 
And then you don't hear another thing said all, all the rest of the meeting because you start meditating on that one thing. I believe that when you preach, when we preach, it's like having a loaf of bread and you break the bread and you give this person a little bit and somebody else gets another bit, but it's all part of what God has for you. And somebody might say, well, I heard this and somebody say, I heard that and somebody else heard something else. But we meditate on a truth. And while you're, while you're there and, and, and here is uh, Paul preaching, and I don't know what he was preaching about, but obviously he must have been preaching about Jesus and the price that he paid and what he had done. And this man that has been crippled from birth starts to meditate, starts to meditate starts to say, man, if that's what Jesus did, I can be healed. If that's what Jesus did, it's mine. It's mine. It's mine. And he was meditating on it. And as he meditated on it, it got inside of him. And Paul perceived that this man has faith to be healed. And he spoke a word which I wonder if he really needed to do it. If the guy had faith to be healed, I reckon in the middle of the meeting, he would have just jumped up on his feet. But Paul gets the message before he does, and he said, jump to your feet. And he jumps up and he just started running everywhere. This is a person that's been crippled from birth. See, what I'm talking about is that we've got to meditate, meditate until it becomes mine, until I get it, till it... See... Oh, shakabundi. <laughs> Experience and feel. How many people know you are redeemed? You know it in your head, but do you know it deep down? Or does the enemy come sometimes and, and, and knocks you? See, if you, if you sat... In, the, in your chair or wherever you, however, whatever, wherever you meet with God. You don't have to do it the way somebody else does it. You just got to do it your way. And you're just sitting there in your chair and you, and you start to meditate and you start to think. And usually there's a little bit of a war goes on for a few minutes. But you start to meditate, I am redeemed. If I start thinking about this too much, I'm going to cry. Because you see, when I'm thinking about I am redeemed, I, I automatically just started to think about the suffering and the cost that it cost my Savior to redeem a wretch like me. And I understand that He did it for me. And I understand that He loved me so much that He did it for me, even though I never deserved it. And so, you see, you've got to trump everything that the devil puts out. You don't deserve it. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know I didn't deserve it, but praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. I am redeemed. I've been washed in the blood. Glory to God. And you start to meditate on it, and you start to think about it. But you see, as you meditate on it, and as you think about it, all of a sudden, out of your innermost being comes worship and praise and adoration. That foul devil is a bad devil. Feel the truth. God is with me. God is with us. Righteousness is mine. I'm righteous. I meditate on it. I meditate. You've got to meditate that, you know, when things... I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Start to meditate on it. Feel the great truths of God. Meditate on it till it gets inside you. Till it permeates itself inside you. You won't do anything. If healing is only, sorry, if healing is only taught and not felt, 
See, healing's got to be more than just taught. You've got to be able to feel, feel it, meditate on it. Meditate on the suffering of Jesus Christ. You see, healing, you don't get healed from the outside. You get healed from the inside. Jesus is not denture rub. It's not some stuff you can rub on it. It's not something you can just put on the outside. It's something that you put on the inside. And you meditate on it. And you allow, allow it to permeate inside you. And, and as you're doing that, your mind will come into conflict at times. But I want to tell you that you can conquer that. I want you to have a look with me at 1 Peter. Have I used too many scriptures? For I will rise, rise above the pain, rise above the guilt, rise above the shame. You know, I can't find Peter. Is he in here? Where are you, Peter? I should I should put markers in, shouldn't I? Oh, dear me. Where are you, Peter? Where's Peter? Ah, oh, there he is. There he is. There he is. One Peter three. It says, "Do not let your adornment be merely outward." Arranging the hair, wearing gold, and putting on fine apparel. I'm, I'm not against any of those things. It's okay. If the house needs painting, you've got to paint it. Rather, listen to this, rather let it be the hidden person of the heart that is incorruptible, Beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So there's an outward thing we can do. There's an inward thing we can do. But let it be more the inward, amen? How did... Uh, have a look at John 4, 24. I'm having trouble here this morning. John 4, 24. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is a story we know. We know this story only too well. And there's, there's a thing. You see, if God says that he is a spirit, and we're made in God's image and God's likeness. And then God says to us to worship him in spirit and in truth. That means that there's a part of me that is spirit. We know the outward man. We know the inward man. We know all this. We've been talking about this now for the last few weeks. So I, I can't just sing a song. It's spirit now. It's my spirit now that wants to get involved. It's my spirit. So if God says, if he says that in his word, that means that there's a part of me that I've got to understand. See, the Bible says it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. He lives in me. See, some of these thoughts are contrary to the natural thinking that God lives in me. No, God lives in heaven. 
No, God lives in me. That's what the Word of God says. He lives in me. It can be a theory or you can feel the truth. How many people have ever, ever in your Christian life experienced the presence of God? Just comes all over. It's God in you. And sort of the Bible speaks about out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. It's Christ in you. He lives in me. Understanding your spirit man and know what he can do. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you can think with your natural mind or you can think with your inner mind, your inner man. I've told this story before. That there was a painter who was painting a house. And the family uh, knew this man quite well. And uh, they were, he was just inside painting. They were all away doing whatever they were doing, work, goodness knows what. But he was in there painting and doing his, doing his job. And, but you see, he was meditating. He was meditating on immoral thoughts. He was thinking about sexual things. He painted this picture in his mind and he was just gone off in this horrible thing, but he was enjoying it so much, this fantasy, immorality. He just filled himself with it. He was meditating on it. Unfortunately, a nine-year-old girl had finished school and came home. The family knew the man and thought everything would be okay. But because he'd been meditating on that, as that nine-year-old girl walked in the door, that thing took over in his life and he raped that little girl. You see, there's a natural man and we've all gone off in fantasy land, perhaps not, pray, not doing that. But oh, I've dreamed of a 26-foot McGregor sailboat with a 50-horsepower outboard motor on the back. I, I have the moment meditate on Ford Ranger, Ute, <laughs> or a... What do you call it? Mazda. <laughs> that your brother owns. <laughs> which I've told him he should give me. <laughs> we, we meditate on, on things and perhaps it's that leather handbag from Gucci Pucci. Maybe that's that dress from somebody else. But you know what? If you meditate on it long enough, I guarantee you, if I keep meditating on that Gregory 26, I'm going to get one. <laughs> You keep meditating on that handbag, you'll get it. But if you keep meditating on the things of God, I'm trying to use a natural expression to bring a spiritual expression. If you do the same, see, it's not, it's not rocket science. It's just dreaming. It's just thinking. And if you, if you, if you somehow or other can do that and just meditate on it and and just start to reach out to, into that area of healing. Perhaps if you need healing in your body, meditate on it. It will be yours. If you meditate on, on whatever it might be, something else. When I first got saved, I, I used to meditate on being a preacher. I would go down, I had a bunch of roosters. They were doomed to die, but I used to go down to them and I'd preach to those roosters. They'd look at me, oh, well, I'm <laughs> They gave me more comments than you are at the moment. <laughs> but I go down there and preach to them and tell them they need to get saved and goodness knows what. And I would imagine many of you have done the same thing. But you meditate on something, you meditate on something, and all of a sudden, one day you find yourself doing it. You meditate, you dream, you dream. You dream things, becomes yours. 
You got a friend in Canada. Young couple. They've, they're dreamers. They're meditators. On their wall, they've got a big board. They've got their dream things. Many of the things on one side are all about the church, what they're dreaming about the church, what they're believing will happen in the church. But there's another area there that they're dreaming about things in the natural. Dreaming about a house. Dreaming about owning a property. Dreaming about going to uh, Hawaii. This people, to my knowledge, have go to Hawaii at least once a year, and they've done that for the last 10 years, to my knowledge. You think, oh, that's okay, they can do that. No, they've also adopted nine children from Haiti. They look after those nine children, and each one of those children that they've uh, got from Haiti cost them over $1,000 by the time they went through all the rigmarole and all the government things and goodness knows what. They've spent a four, $100,000 $100, each, I think they were. They've spent a fortune. These are people that just believe, and, and God, the God who is of, of the exceedingly abundantly above. When, when my dad, who was not a good man, he wouldn't, didn't want anything to do with God, I found out later on that because I'd achieved a little bit in in Christian Outreach Center, they call me the big shot. The big shot. And my mother spoke it out one day when she was a little bit delirious. And my brother was standing beside me and I looked at him and he went, that's how we talk about you. That's what we think about you. That's what we think. The big shot. But you see, there was hopelessness around my dad and there'd be people here that might have a husband or a wife or a child or a grandchild or something like that and around their life it seems impossible. But if you start to use some of the principles that I'm talking about this morning, you could see a change. Because you see, my dad, there was nothing around him that wanted God. Roy and Millie, my cousins here, I'd be talking pretty right. He was a gambler, an alcoholic, and a few other things. But you see, there was a man in our church, and he looked very much like my dad. And I used to watch him regularly. And as, as he would have his hands raised, I would picture my dad. I would picture my dad with his hands raised. I meditated on it. And when I wasn't in church and I couldn't see him, I would send, then meditate on that, seeing my dad with his hands raised, worshipping God. One day, when dad, I think, was 84 or 83, he came to church. He went out the front and he surrendered his life to Jesus. And I saw him as the man said, raise your hand. I pray that you can catch what I'm saying today. That if we start to meditate and not see what the enemy wants us to see, but see in the Spirit and see your husband, see him changed. See your children changed. See them in the house of God. See them worshipping God. See them doing something. You're not doing it yourself, but God will do it through you. I, I See, we talk about getting under the spout where the glory comes out. But you, you actually, when you go like that, you shift your position. And now it's a different position. And now God can do something. Over here, he may not be able to do it. Stephen Carmen, you've got no idea the list of things I saw their list. I thought, you've got to be joking. 
But I've been around those kids long enough now and there's not one of those things that are still on the list. They've got another list now. They've ticked them all off. Because God's not a withholder. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. We just got to somehow or other start to dream dreams and believe God. In the Spirit, you can do lots of things. You see, because the God that we serve, this is who He is. He said, the Bible says, that God calls those things that be not as though they were. And so when you're meditating on seeing your husband or your children or your wife or your grandchildren, whatever it might be, in the house of God, you're beginning to call something that bees, that bees not. <laughs> As though it were. You catch my drift? That's not how it is. It's quite contrary. But when God spoke that, He spoke to a man who was 100 years old and a woman who was 99 and told them that they're going to have a baby. God calls things that be not as though they were. And so when you get in, that's who we are. So we now can start calling things that be not as though they were. And you start to speak things into existence. You start to speak. The Bible says you can have whatsoever you say. If we're saying negative things, guess what you're going to have? You're going to have negative things. In the Spirit, you can do all things. Whatever it is. And I know that there's some people here this morning that want to change some areas around your life. Some things, some circumstances, some situations that need to be changed. There are some people that need to be healed. Friend, I, I believe. And you, if you go, people say, well, how come people get healed over in India? How come we see all these great miracles? But if you listen to the messages that are preached on all those occasions, they're preaching about different stories of a woman who had an issue of blood, how she pulled in the press and touched the hem of his garment. They talk about different ones of healing and deliverance, how Jesus did this. And while they're, th while they're hearing these words, if it just goes over your head, and one of the things us Westerners have done very, very good is we allow the Word of God just to go over our head. But we've got to grab it and we've got to pull it down and we've got to meditate on it. We've got to start believing it. And I believe that a lot of those people in India and places like that where hopelessness is all around their life, an evangelist comes into town and starts talking about the healing power of Jesus how blind eyes were opened. And if there's somebody sitting there with blind eyes, all of a sudden hope begins to rise within them. And they begin to meditate and they begin to say, oh my God, if you're really real, if that's what you can do. And they meditate on it until it gets on the inside of them. And I want to tell you, in those great crusades, and I've been over on some of them with Steve Ryder and other guys, most of those people that are getting healed, they're getting healed with nobody laying hands on them. And I'm praying for the day when we'll see crusades where thousands upon thousands of people will just throw crutches away and, and throw different things away and be touched by the power of God, by the anointing of God, where, where they begin to grab a hold of it and meditate on it and say, that is mine. But I want to say, if there's something you can do today to bless yourself, is say that the Word of God is mine. I am healed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I am saved. I am redeemed. I am a child of the Most High God. I am, I am, I am. God can touch you in a mighty way. This morning, if you have caught something, perhaps what I've shared this morning, and... One of the great lies of the enemy is that 
Everybody's going to heaven. It would be wonderful if that was so. We wouldn't need to have church. We could all be down the beach today. A bit cold. But you see, you must be born again. Can a believer backslide? Yes. Do we need to come back to God? Yes. What will change my circumstances? Number one, you must come back to God. You must come back to God. You must come back to God. Jesus spoke to a man, Nicodemus, and he said, Marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. You must believe the Word of God and you meditate on it. You feel. I guarantee you if you went home or tomorrow sometime when it's not so busy and you sat in a corner, just sit somewhere in your office, wherever it might be, and just get a truth from the Word of God. Just stop and meditate. 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 It gets inside you. Start to get rejoicing about it. Be happy. See your husband, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, whatever it is, worshiping Jesus. Change the whole atmosphere of your house. See them with their hands right. You've got no idea when I saw my dad with his hands raised. And the guy kept talking. And he kept talking. And I thought, my, any minute, you, you, you're blowing it. You did a good job so far, but you're blowing it now because dad, his, 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 his patience fuse is about, well, I think it didn't even have one. I thought, he's not going to stay here. But you see, when the Spirit of God's there, he just stayed there with his hands raised. He said the sinner's prayer. I walked out behind him because he one stage he said, are you coming out? I said, okay, I'll come out with you. And then he looked at me and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> Born again. See, we're the church. We're the church. We're going to stand to our feet.